And welcome to another exciting edition of the Mark Clark Show. Let me get my picture of my baby out of here for some reason. Bootsy Vegas. Yes, sir. Hello there. What's going on, Bootsy? You looking you looking uh, very well rested, my friend. Well, you know, uh, for the first time in 2022, I, I got a vacation this week. So okay. God, thank the vacation gods. Well, look at you all refreshed and ready to go. Mr. I Vegas have- on a show. And I also had an amazing weekend, so, you know. Well, on our show today, one of my favorite people, she is a young gun, Bootsy. She she has done a lot in her very young age. She's like, she, you know, we went we went to lunch the other day, and it really hit me. I was like, you, you could be my daughter. Wow. And, I, and how proud I would be. Oh, wow. She's, you know, she's, you know, you see her on Good Morning America. You see her on Dr. Oz. You see her... Uh, putting makeup on celebrities. You see her uh, sharing the latest fashions, the latest trends, the latest. If you need to know what's hot and what's not, you go to her. The people, the movers and the shakers, the head honchos, the top dogs, the influencers call her to find Mm. out what is going on. And she's been in this game a long time, but she's just a baby and she's got so much more. Ladies and gentlemen, Joining us, Denise, the Denise Caldwell, joining us on the show. What's up, Denise? Oh, you can't hear? Oh, wow. And Well, talk to us. Mm. You talk. You talk. Oh, we can't hear you either. She can't even hear the talk part, so she might want to log in and log back off. You know what I mean? Maybe we can tell them to do that. Okay. But uh, yeah, man. So Bootsy, I saw you sent me this. Uh, I didn't have a chance to load it up, but the the, the classic battle. Oh man, it was amazing. It was a musical cultural experience I've never experienced before. Uh, this is something that will definitely be in my book. I was in a room with Carlos Santana, and he did not look real. So, you know, it's amazing. So you know, Bootsy, you had a chance to not only see Carlos Santana. Weren't you with Earth, Wind, and Fire? Yeah, 100%. So with Earth, Wind, and Fire, seeing Carlos Santana, um, that's crazy, man. Yeah, and the crazy thing is the tour has been the the highest grossing tour, uh, one of the highest grossing tours for that demographic, and they're talking about shooting a documentary and going to Africa. Um, So I kind of threw my hat in the ring, like, hey, guys, I got a... Seven hundred hours of leave available. Like, hey, you know. Uh, so I'm kind of throwing throwing my hat into it. It's a really, it was, you know. Sometimes you think you've seen it all, or you think you experienced it all. I had never, I have never experienced nothing like what I saw Carlos Santana do, which was very go go ish because it was percussion driven. It was, you know, led by percussions, highly Afrocentric, but also his imagery behind him is very Afrocentric. From the motherland, he fused all these things together. It was such a multicultural experience as well, because there were black people. There were every demographic was at this show, and, and you group. know, so yeah, it, it, it was really amazing. And I had never, I was not that familiar with Carlos Santana's music, so that was something as well. I knew some of it, but to experience it and just you know take the vibe in was really amazing. So it was really an amazing cultural experience i i am begging them to do a documentary on this i'm like i know y'all talking about it but make sure 
This is documented. I don't know if people would, this would ever happen again with these two cultural pop musical icons from two different demographics, two different nationalities coming together for this amazing Afrocentric cultural experience and two different philosophies. So I just hope that the world really get to see it. It's actually so amazing. I told Raheem, we got to go see them. So I'm taking Raheem in the next couple of weeks. We're going to go because I told him that he needs, he, he needs to see this. Rube, that's uh, Raheem Devon. Now, okay, enough of I'm you, sorry. Booty Vegas. I think Denise is back. Denise, <laughs> yes, we can hear her. Denise Caldwell, oh, the ladies and gentlemen, Denise Caldwell. Welcome to the show, Denise. How are you? Hi. I'm, I'm interested in the concert. I'm like, wait, Booty, take me too. Oh, you can, uh, well, you know, you family, you can always go. So now Booty just hopped off for some reason. So, <laughs> so Denise, um, you know, I really, you know, a lot of times, uh, you do segments on TV shows across the country, shows across the country, where you feature, you know, items, clothing, just a variety of things. Uh, you're kind of like, you know, you, you're kind of always, in a sense, working. And so we wanted you to have, we'll, we'll talk about what you do, but really we wanted to get into get into who Denise Caldwell is. Because again, <laughs> some people have seen your face and be like, oh, I know her. You, you work closely with Dr. Oz on his show. So Denise, for those who, you know, again, so talk about what you do and talk about what you do as far as that presenting piece. And then we'll get into the beginning of it all. Okay. Well, I am a lifestyle expert and I specialize in fashion and beauty, but I also specialize in those things that you didn't know you needed until mm -hmm. I showed them to you. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like the friend in your head type of TV personality. I feel like I've never met a stranger. I will talk people down. I think, Mark, you know that. I mean, we sat there for like, what, it was 15 minutes. Next thing you know, it's three hours past. Um, so that really is just me naturally. So I've never met a stranger. So when I do TV, it's like I'm coming into people's home. They graciously have let me come into their home for like the last six years on national platforms and also the top 25 local television platforms. And, you know, we shop together. I show them things. Um, I make them laugh a little bit. And sometimes it's even before they have their coffee. So, you know, they really have to be engaged um, with, with you to stick around for those two and a half minutes, maybe four minutes if you get that much on TV. Um, and it's really been a blessing. Um, and it all started with me doing a lot of, like, celebrity styling and stuff. But I really like TV. Um, it's something that I've been able to make money off of, but also just meet a lot of great people um, and really just be like that friend in your head type of TV personality that has transcended from just doing fashion makeovers to now actually doing more lifestyle television, talking about, you know, travel and essentials that m both men, women, he, she, they, him, you know, you got to get all the pronouns in there, um, might need. <laughs> And so then you, and we talked about this. You kind of had a success at a very early age, but so take us behind the scenes because you actually, you know, is it, it was that kind of the makeup and and the fashion and and take us behind like your early your early days in the game. Yeah, so I started um, in the on the fashion styling side behind the scenes, and I've worked for so, some amazing fashion editors and stylists, um, a lot of designers during New York Fashion Week. This is like my 22nd fashion season of New York Fashion Week. Um, I celebrated 10 years styling for the Met Gala, and I've been able to be a part of a lot of great styling teams um, everywhere from Sarah Jessica Parker to Jennifer Lopez, Beyonce, um, our former first lady, Mrs. Obama, I was able to do an amazing photo shoot um, with her at the White House with uh, Harper's Bazaar magazine. And they had a great team. Um, pretty much every celebrity I've kind of had my hand in in some type of way, whether it was helping, helping to assist or to actually like curate fashion racks for other stylists so that they could get the red carpet items that they needed. Um, and then I started working with brands like Sally Hansen and Estee Lauder, Matt Cosmetic, um, even Jergens Hand Lotion. Um, and it was all behind the scenes, just really getting a lot of fashion and stuff. And then I always loved fashion myself. So when I decided that I didn't want to do as much celebrity, I really went into what we call general market. So a lot of our retailers like Walmart and Macy's, um, Neutrogena and Olay. Well, it was Olay, then it was Olay. 
now it's Olay. Um, so working with different brands where I still was styling, but then I started actually like working with them and doing spokesperson stuff a little bit here and there, just kind of like videos. And then the TV stuff came and then more digital opportunities came. And then a lot of spokesperson work came. Um, I'm, I think I'm popularly known as the spokesperson for the brand Fruit of the Loom um, and their brand Fit For Me. When they created uh, the plus size brand Fit For Me by Fruit of the Loom, I was the person that came in and consulted, told them how the waistband on the underwear should fit. We launched the activewear and leisure line um, that was a top seller on Amazon as well. And I was able to collaborate with Walmart. So it really became like this Midwestern girl like really going and dealing with like people and meeting them and just really helping them with great makeovers so that they could dress with confidence. And that's where my tagline came in, dress with confidence. So then I was known as the expert that helped you to look good and feel good. So Denise, or I can feel, I'm not even looking at Boosie. I can feel he can't wait to ask. There's so many questions where to begin. That's why I call him the questioner. So sit back, Denise, you about to get questioned. No, hey, 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 don't be building me up. Cause this will be the one time I have a bad show. And you didn't build me up this, you know what I mean? So. No, Boots, you got, I'm just saying, I know you're curious. I know you have questions because there is a lot, like, how did you get there? Da, da, da. So go yeah. ahead, Boots, I know you got questions. No, I mean, you know, just from a Midwestern perspective, I would love to know where did you grow up at and how did the Midwest dictate your style? Because, you know, um, and, you know, every geographical area has different styles or whatever. So I would love to know just the beginning stages of where you're from. And how did that uh, cultivate your style and would you end up becoming this amazing stylist? Well, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, um, wow. Oh, now I yeah. see. Oh. <laughs> now and the team I, is I, alive I, and well. Family, I, I grew know. up listening to Mark Clark on Magic 108. So I was like, oh, when I saw him in the studio, I like kind of commandeered and summed it. I was like, could you get him for me? And I didn't think he was going to come out. And he did. And I was like, oh. Uh, there is a guy. I was like, I, I would love to meet you. I was like, and then when I saw him, I'm like, you look like my dad. It was, it was just so, it was well, a Denise, cool there's something moment. we need to tell you. I am. No, I'm joking. Mm -mm, his be, name I'll is Dennis. <laughs> I'm right. named after my dad. Okay, okay, my, okay, okay. All right. I'll be the surrogate dad. Yes. Um, But no, I grew up in St. Louis, and so you can't spell hustle without STL. So I feel oh, like wow. everybody well from St. Louis you can put them anywhere and they're going to survive and they're going to hustle and make something happen. So that really was it. I grew up in St. Louis. I went to school in DC at Howard university. Thank hey, hey, you. You know, um, and yeah, <laughs> from there, Howard is like a microcosm of the world. So I actually studied chemistry, um, wow. in college. So I wanted to be a doctor, the fashion part, my, my father, um, he was, he's a military man. And so when he was in Germany, he had all these amazing coats. He DJ between him and my mom. Like I was a shopper and I was a fashion person already. Like, you know, my mom is like, you give her a hundred dollars. She gonna come back with like three outfits. She had a meal and she had a taxi ride to still get home and tip the driver. Like, I don't know how she does it, but she always finds some way to like hustle out to get everything that she needed, um, maybe a lipstick or earrings included with the outfit. I mean, I don't know. But between her and my dad, I was always really fashionable. Um, but that didn't mean I wanted to work in fashion. It just really kind of started happening. I knew at some point chemistry and being a doctor wasn't going to be my thing. Um, and my grandmother was like, okay, well, you're going to go to med school. What you going to do? And I was like, I don't know. I need to figure this out. So I just started doing internships. And then I slowly but surely found myself in fashion. I knew I wanted to move to New York by the time graduation came. I just wasn't sure what the opportunity was going to be. Mm -hmm. I would love to know just in general, just being at, at a high level of just fashion and makeup in general, is there, what are the differences culturally and raking through the racial lines or whatever? I know, you know, black people have their swag. Other people ha have their swag. How have you been able to navigate that? being a Midwestern African-American sister in DC, what has that been like? What has that been like for you? 
I think I was already kind of prepared for the division because, I mean, if people know St. Louis, they know. I, I like to say when I describe it, it's definitely a sports town. You know, it's, it's themed off sports and it's themed off the Catholic religion. I feel like the Pope has visited St. Louis more than any other city in the United States. If you can count on your hands, like growing up, the Pope was always there. It didn't matter which Pope it was. Somehow they were there. So I thought it was, you know, divided by sports, divided by religion, mostly Catholic, and also divided by race. So growing up, I went to a math and science school. Um, it was a magnet school. We had Bosnian, um, you know, and Asians in our school that overpopulated everybody before they really populated in St. Louis. So I got exposed to a lot of different races. And I grew up in the Central West End. So you know, it was kind of like the middle class of it all. And so, you know, you walk down the street, you know, Wash U was up the street, Helena's, the Chase Park Plaza, like it was so many different things. Um, so I really wasn't too like uh, resistant to it per se. I just always wanted to go to Howard because, you know, I'm an 80s baby. So I grew up with the Cosby Kids in Different World and Debbie Allen. And, you know, I wanted to be the next Debbie Allen, honey. You couldn't tell me. Um, that I wasn't going to be Debbie Allen. I just loved me some Debbie Allen and Felicia Rashad. So when I got to Howard, it was just more so completing my journey of wanting to go to Howard. And the fact that it was an HBCU was just icing on the cake. I will say when I got to New York, being a plus size woman, a black woman and young and not having that much experience, I really had to rely just on my personality and my gifts and my hard work and my grit. So a lot of people don't necessarily want to do that. You know, um, I never got the cliche black girl attitude, head roll type thing. Um, it was just really more like, oh, she's vibrant. Oh, she's nice. Oh, she works hard. Oh, you know, well, she's plus size. How'd she get this job? Or, you know, it just, it would be different things. And there would mm -hmm. be um, little persnippity comments, but I always would win people over. And I will say that, I'm more, I'm very grateful for the people that happen to be, you know, what we now call allies. I had a lot of allies back in the day that really helped me to get to where I needed to be. And I still do. Um, you know, a lot of producers, um, a lot of executive producers, um, you know, as Mark mentioned, Dr. Oz, you know, putting me on TV, Bethany Frankel taking a chance on me. I had no TV experience. She was my first national platform. Um, so a lot of people really were just like, oh, you know, she seems like she knows what she's talking about and she's oh, wow. so nice that they, they, you know, they took a chance and other people's like, yeah, she, she has this background. She just never did camera before, but look at her. She smiled. I think she's going to be great. And, oh. you know, I just, I was, it's a guy. Yeah, well, glory. I would love to know, you know, talk about, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Oz or whatever. What has that, what has the Dr. Oz experience been like? Because, He's becoming an interesting, polarizing person. I would love to know what was it like for you, you know, working with, with Dr. Oz, and what has it been like as he's transitioned to Republican strategist, you know, senator thing? What, what has that been like? Um, you know what? I remember the first time I met um, Dr. Oz, and, and people would say Mamet because that's his first name, and... Um, he was just so sweet. I remember rehearsal. Like I had did um, Bethany a couple of times and I had did a Canada show. Um, mm -hmm. So I had kind of seen how the TV segments go. Mm -hmm. And none of the head people come to rehearsal because he is a heart thoracic surgeon, very established, you know, that type of person. He comes to rehearsal. So it doesn't matter if it's 6 a.m., he's at rehearsal. Wow. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's Dr. Oz over there. He's at rehearsal. And we went through and he was looking like, oh, okay, who's this new fresh face? And then we did the rehearsal. It was really quick. You know, it was just like, just kind of nod and shake, but he wanted to go through the lines. Mm -hmm. And then I went and did my makeup. And I think he could tell when we got back on, I had my outfit on and everything because I was so nervous. Like three producers had come in and we decided on what my outfit would be. <laughs> And I was talking about underwear. So I was comfortable because that was my wheelhouse to talk about underpinnings, how, but we were talking about how to prevent cellulite. And so everybody was saying cellulite, cellulite. So I was like, I'm going to just say both. And then just make a joke, like, depending on what region you're in, you may say, say cellulite, but cellulite, cellulite, but this wow. is how you prevent it with your underwear. So I had my talking points, 
And I think he looked over as we were about to film. And I remember hearing, because it got really quiet, and he was like, Denise. And I turned and he was <laughs> like, good luck. And I was like, oh, thank you. So we did it. It went by so fast. I literally, I got downstairs. We got dressed and took a couple of pictures. Producer came and said, you are amazing. Can we book you for like next week for another show that we're filming, you know, that's going to air sometime next month. So it became this dance and this duo. And then he started remembering my name. And then he called me the Carbonista. Wow. He said, hey, you know, friends of the show, Denise is here, the Carbonista. And I was like, oh, and we were in rehearsal one time and he read the prompter and it didn't say Carvanista. He went back and told um, Sam, which was one of the producers, he was like, make sure you put the Carvanista in there. So I was like, oh, Lord, this is about to be the Oprah effect. Like, <laughs> ching, ching. And it was like after that um, episode aired with the underwear, I got my contract with Fruit of the Loom. Wow. And I had been their spokesperson after that for five years. And that was... I mean, we're talking about a check that was like low six figures, but it was still six figures. Six and figures. I was like, six figures. And let me oh, tell you something right now. Six figures, six Child. figures. So, low, high, mid. If it's six exactly. figures on there, we're doing great over here. Yes. <laughs> so, Denise, let me ask you this question. Were you surprised about his Republican ally uh, uh, um, strategies, his, his embracing the whole Republican thing? Because that shocked a lot of people, including it's, me. I know that it did. Like, I mean, even um, because Philadelphia is a market that I do a lot. And one of the markets that I do, you know, that's where he's located um, and running. You know, he had to he had to give up his show. And so um, a lot of my people that I've become friends with, you know, they were they had another show that they tried with Daphne Oz coming on board, which is his daughter. Um, and that, you know, finished out the season, but I know a lot of people missed, you know, he was like America's doctor. Right. Um, and it possibly still is, I would say politics is a little thing. It's not my tea. Um, mm -hmm. I was just texting somebody today because we have primaries in New York and although I do my civic duty and I've, I've helped, you know, in the political realm, I care about family and community. Right. So I have to care about politics. But that's really not my thing. So I really wouldn't be able to say who a person is, mm -hmm. you know, on that spectrum. But mm -hmm. do I think that he cares about family? Absolutely. Did he give me a shot and continuously make sure that I was on screen and that I was branded correctly? Absolutely. Was he always kind and a gentleman to me? Absolutely. Am I a woman of color? Absolutely. Am I a Democrat? He may not have known that, but yes, I vote Democrat, you know, and I can be a little radical or I can be a little conservative at times, but, um, you know, we'll see what happens. No, I love that. And let me say this. You are well skilled. The way you just navigated and moved to that, <laughs> that was really good. Well, yeah, well played, Denise. Man, that was really good. Don't mess up the money. We trying to get another <laughs> I like that. Okay. So. But you know what, Bootsy? It's it's genuine. Like, I mean, he met my mom. Like, my mom was always welcome. He always had amazing snacks in the dressing room. His team <laughs> never seemed like they oh, were dissatisfied. Man. You know, I mean, you know how we heard re remnants and buzz with Ellen towards the end? I yeah. never heard that about Dr. Oz and his show. So work ethic wise, making sure his team got paid well, making sure that guests felt welcome. I mean, you know, the line was always wrapped around the corner to come the to the, the show. Bad, Denise. So the cure of the I don't bad, know. Denise. Yeah. So I Denise. wish him I wish him well. And of course he's always in my prayers because anybody that's good to me, I pray that God be good Respect. to them. Respect. So, so and, Denise, and, and, you you were you are actually in uh switching directions a little bit. Um the um the uh you actually were in the industry you're in the fashion industry right mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so break it down because you know as a kanye west fan and i, I kind of marvel at the things that he does right you ain't got the answer sway you ain't got the answer <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. denise we saw we saw him you know and again to, to the to the eyes of the public you know the, the be crazy piece what happened was it really kind of changed it kind of like changed the fashion world right from from um, you know what happened at um, well the, the late uh, Virgil Abloh now right mm -hmm. um, him being put moved in a certain position obviously they weren't going to put Kanye West in that position but they did make a move because I think they, there was a certain amount of pressure and then to the success of his 
of Kanye West is the fashion stuff that he does from the deal to the deal with Gap to his deal with Adidas to his clothing lines and his shoes that people, you know, people say, oh, they're ugly or this and that. At the end of the day, I don't think we've kind of ever witnessed anybody, especially a black person, have this degree of success in the fashion industry. But what what were you surprised at that kind of like the fallout? I mean, because it's still, you know, still I think there's still people that think he you was know, crazy, he's this, he's that. But at the end of the day, business wise, the brands, the brands are very valuable. Like, like we were at the mall the other day. And it's so funny, it's it's always controversy. So, you know, he 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 his new sweaters were dis- displayed in a big some say garbage bag at the gap, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like, yeah. And so you hear people, the buzz was, oh my God, he's got it in a garbage bag. But I actually was, we were at uh, out at the at the mall and, and I saw it and it, it really, it, you know, I didn't think garbage bag, you just were walking by and you're like, what is that? It was, it was yeah. like a pod. It was like a pod and it was doing probably what it was designed to do was make people stop and look and walk into the gap. And then you walked into the gap and it was the first time I ever actually got a chance to touch whatever this thing he's making. And these sweaters were $250 and the quality was crazy. It was like that old school sweats that 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 super heavy, you know, that they don't make anymore. And I was like, wow, this, this guy must be a genius. Because again, you know, you just walk past the gap. Everybody was stopping and on. Some people were like, oh, that's too expensive. It was creating a con- conversation. So I get that's I'm not really a question. So yeah, what's your take on all that and all that's going on with that with these brands and stuff that he's done? Well, you know, Kanye's from the Midwest. He's from Chicago. So you either get, I feel like for Chicago, you either get Bama or you get fabulous. Um, because my my aunt, my great grandmother, my my great aunt lives there. Like, you know, I, I got roots in Chicago. And, you know, some people come up straight from Mississippi or Arkansas. So you know, they got flair. Like my my great grandmother, her church group, I showed a picture at my grandmother's funeral and my first ladies were like, wait, they dress like that, their church group? She was like, oh, we got to step it up. You know, um, and we knew Kanye always loved fashion. And I think the Gap thing was genius because that's where he retailed and worked, um, wasn't always acknowledged, complained how they treated him. Um, and let's be honest, when was the last time people really shopped at the Gap? Like people shop at Old Navy and a little bit at Banana Republic if you are a career like driven person. But even Banana Republic was having transitions. I work a lot with Old Navy and I know, you know, Old Navy always Gap Inc. wise. Um, I feel like they keep the lights on because everybody shops at Old Navy, you know, and they have extended sizes and stuff. So I think that was a very smart move for the Gap. And it made sense for Kanye because it told a story. Like people don't realize what the story is, but if you like, if you're a Kanye fan, you know Kanye worked at the Gap, and he despised it, but he loved it, and you know different things. So it's exciting to see. But two hundred fifty dollars for the Gap is a lot because that's not normally their price point. So mm-hmm. it's really what we would call a collaboration in the um, fashion industry, and more so like um, they'll do special pop up stores and that type of stuff, and it's something that's exclusive, but it's not always going to be there. So it'll be interesting to see what other pieces he makes um yeah i think it's just been genius for him um to go that way but he was always fly like he always wore polo and did different things so he always had this swag about him and if you do and you're able to have a great team which he does um one of his stylists uh rennie i've known her i actually worked with her when they used to style fergie uh when fergie first came out on her own and london bridge came out and Rennie worked for Daria Hines, who is uh, the late Gregor- Gregory Hines. Yep, Gregory Hines' daughter. Daria wow. was a huge stylist, and Fergie was her client. Fergie had just um, separated or kind of transitioned as a solo artist from Black Eyed Peas, and Rennie was one of her lead assistants. And I worked as a second assistant. It was so first class, and then I remember seeing Rennie with Kanye. And then seeing her on the Kardashians, and I was like, wow, she had great style. So he has really amazing people on his team um that are great and then Virgil's from Chicago too so that was just you know amazing how Off-White was able to transition and then him being with um you know Louis Vuitton and just like just different things that he was doing um Kanye really had a hand in that too but but Denise you know what else I think Kanye is at this point he is America's guilty pleasure 
We can't ignore him. <laughs> you think so? Oh, oh, like, like the, the thing about him is, he's like, do, do you watch wrestling? You watch, you watch WWE, WWF wrestling? I grew up on it. I was a tomboy back okay. in the day. He, he is like the heel in wrestling. <laughs> he gets you to react. He gets you to re He sets you up. Like, when I first saw the Gap bag thing, and, and, and I knew in my mind, oh, Kanye is just getting your, getting your attention. Yep. Kanye is like the new OJ. You cannot no. ignore him. No. Uh, uh, well, well, hold on. I, I don't mean with that part. I'm just saying, like, America cannot ignore OJ 30 years later. America cannot ignore Kanye. Yeah. Uh, Kanye is America's guilty pleasure. No matter what happens, he gets people to react. And I think there is genius in that. And I think it's more well played than, than we think. Because two things about him. He don't care. And he really <laughs> don't care. People say he don't care. He, don't care. Care. <laughs> he really don't care. And he sees it first. Yeah, and his job is to get you to react. So I just think we him. The real genius is he makes America respond to him. He can, I mean, he could say something, and Soldier Boy could say something, and they would. It could be the same exact thing. We would ignore Soldier Boy, and Kanye would trend for. Well, they're two really? different calibers, but we did when, when, exactly. when Soldier Boy said Drake. Everybody was right? that one, you know. So it depends. But I will say Kanye is that you know where people say. um I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams. Like, who do you know that he knew fashion so well? And it's funny because, you know, not to put them against each other, but like how Jay-Z knew and put us on to so many amazing things, like Audemars, Audemars watches and, you know, um, talking what about the? the different liqueurs and stuff. Yeah. Kanye was doing it more so on the higher end of fashions. And it also was a refinement to it because he looked good. He had this swag. Um, and then he had other, like his, his ex-girlfriend, the original one that was the Delta. She, Alexis, was a fashion designer and still is. So he loved fashion. So I really feel like he's more of that person that is your ancestor's wildest dreams because mm. his mama was educated. He knew he was supposed to go right. to school and get a degree, but he still was smart because, you know, you can't be around Dr. Donda West and not soak up what she had. So he was like, these folks can't tell me nothing. I don't care what they say. I'm a date who I want, say what I want, do what I want. They ain't going to lock me up. They ain't going to beat me up. They going to buy my clothes. They going to buy my records. And, and, yeah, and, and he's still gonna stand up for black people. He's gonna talk about the white people. He gonna date the white people. He gonna date the black people. I mean, he might even date a man at some point. I don't know. Kanye <laughs> gonna do what Kanye gonna do. Kanye is Kanyeing, and I'm here for it all. <laughs> so Denise and and Bootsy, we always Denise, we always have these moments on the show, and I think it's I think it's just the caliber of guests we have, and 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 also for me, Bootsy, I don't know if it happens to you. Sometimes things that you're thinking about don't make sense in the outside world. Then it comes on the show and it makes sense. And so it's so crazy. I've been I've been working on a comedy routine, right? And mm. this concept I was talking about, I'm, I'm in the middle. I'm like a motivational speaker. So it's almost like too much motivational speaker and not enough comedy. But this point that I was trying to play with, Denise, you just brought up, and I'm now I can now I can use it. And so it's not on a comedy stage. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> She so, wanted a low end six figure check, sir. Make sure it's a low right. end six figure. So, so this point that again happens because of Denise brought it up that I had this thought of, guys, was how in our culture, especially rap, especially rap, right? It's like rap and the hood and the black and the da, da, da. There's a certain disingenuousness within it that is a problem, even with those people we love. So my thing was, Bootsy, as we talked about, when you talk about jazz or whatever, and somebody who's the best sax player, who's the best pianist, the beauty of jazz was, well, we're going to have a jam session Thursday night anyway. So in every city that artists played, they played their main gig, and there'd be a jam session. So anybody who thought they was nice could come on out and play, and then the whole world can see, right? It wasn't, and so it wasn't no beef. It was the truth. It was like the coldest piano player in Kansas City is fill in the blank, right? And so when we talk about hip hop, and again, I love Jay-Z. I love, you know, these artists. And Jay-Z 
and 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 you know the Jay Z's of the world and the Dame Dashes of the world and so and so. But like you said, Denise, here's the part, Puffy and these guys. Here's the part that never gets talked about. Because now everybody and all every Jay song now everybody's got Basquiat, you know. Uh, every, everybody does. All the producers, uh, 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 my man um, married to Alicia Keys. Everybody's an art. Everybody's an art fanatic. Everybody's an art fanatic, right? But what never gets said is you never hear Jay Z say, "Thank you, Kanye, for bringing the game to us." Because, mm. like you said, Denise, this wasn't a cat. Kanye <laughs> was a student of art, and even though New York cats, you know, you knew Basquiat, you knew certain things, you were not students of it. Like you said, mm-hmm. he was a student of fashion, but nobody ever. And Jay's ego, you never hear them really break it off. Because remember, as Jay Z, as Kanye pointed out, when I did Jesus Walks, y'all looked at me like I couldn't rap because I wasn't from the hood. You know, uh, business wise, uh, what you call it, Dame Dash got it because mm-hmm. he said, but see, but everybody, what, what can you really be not be from the hood and be a rapper, right? And, you know, and so. You know what I mean? So as 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 transparent as Jay Z kind of is now, and these artists are, they're really not that transparent because they never really. At the end of the day, it was like you said, Kanye was kind of an in- intellectual person who came from an intellectual family, who was smart, but they never really give it to him, you know. And we never have, you know what I mean? And so that's the part I kind of. It's not a beef, but it's just something that you like because he's fearless. Because he's fearless, and he has the ears of people. Kanye can move. He can move. He hasn't used it correctly because, you know, he was supporting Trump. But one thing yeah. about him is he's educated and he's fearless. Mm-hmm. And like that day when he got up there and said, George Bush don't like black people. That was that was different to say that for a city to where George Bush had to respond to him. Mm-hmm. And a way else, you know what I mean? In a moment. That's, that's power, bro. Now, and he know. didn't care what they said or what they did. He was like, point. as so now, or so, going up and grabbing a mic from a young blonde Caucasian girl <laughs> to defend and advocate for a sister. I mean, we always right. want to talk about advocating. That was advocating whether he was wrong or not. He yeah. still went right. on that VMA. I'm not mentioning no names, but he went on that VMA stage and he took that from that young girl who was another color spectrum and then mm. protected mm. a brown skin girl. And, you know, I'm gonna let you talk. Yeah, that, that, that was, that was on, interesting. Hold on, I'm gonna let you talk, I'm gonna let you talk. <laughs> but so, that's true talk though. But that, now, now, talk about advocating. That's now, so that true. Advocating. And so, and now, to, and then now I'm gonna flip it again now, guys, we'll move, we'll move past Kanye. So enough Kanye, but Denise, I wanted to get your take. So, Andrew Talley, who passed mm-hmm. away, right? Andre Leon Talley. Andre Leon, Andre Leon Talley. Mm-hmm. Denise, right. the part, the part that's I think heartbreaking, Denise, is that, and 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 you know, I'm I'm on the same, I'm on the, I'm 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 on the path to change history too, in that you know these people have these amazing careers, but at the end of the day, to die broke, and have all this influence and to leave so much and so many people standing on your shoulders but then at the end that bank account is barren denise what can we do i mean first of all did you have run did you meet him in your i mean you probably I'm sure you have do you have any stories about him and then how do we arrive at that to be so influential but then in the day them pockets aren't right at the end. I'm, I'm fighting it now i'm trying to get there i'm trying to i'm trying to get make sure my not only it, it's not just me it's it's, the, it's your legacy your, it's your legacy family. Your, your family. So I'm sorry. Go ahead, Denise. Yeah, I think it's I, well. I think it's different too. Um, he didn't have a legacy. You have a legacy. You have a you have a help me, and then you have children. So it's a little different. Like somebody's gonna take care of somebody. Gonna take care of somebody. You know. So it's a little different uh, with uh, Mr. Leon Talley's legacy. He didn't have that. Um, and I think he tried to keep his legacy going. You know, he grew up. Um, he's from North. He was from North Carolina. Um, you know, his family was, um, a hardworking family. I had the pleasure of meeting Andre on several occasions. I know certain people that are great friends of him that are like fashion mentors that are still reeling from this. Like I was at an event the other day and one fashion editor, you could just feel the pain. She was like, yeah, cause I spoke about Andre and then, 
it was almost like we had talked and then the champagne came and she still wanted to tell her story on how they met and how other stuff and um she went to atlanta um there's a amazing college there um that's like a textile designer college in atlanta and they gave an award um for him too and it's like a scholarship fund and stuff so people are still reeling because you know when it happened COVID was still kind of going on and not everybody everybody was around the world he touched the world like he touched so many people and you know his best friends were Karl Lagerfeld and you know it, he just he had every social circle um that you could imagine and I just remember one time I was an intern and we knew we knew him and you know when he would come he had these amazing capes that he would just walk in and he was so tall and statuesque and i could really see it we wanted to get into this fashion show so we were waiting and we had no ticket and this was when brian park um was there and i had um worked under fern malice who's the creator of new york fashion week i was one of her interns and so i knew how you could get to the tents but at this point, I wasn't working in France. So I didn't really have like the VIP access anymore. So we're standing out there and he see us and he like whisks us under his cape. <laughs> and I'm five two, so I can get under. And so me and another friend, we just go under there in the cake and cape and we're able to go to I never forget it was uh Proenza Schuler's show and Prabhu Garang show. And they were young, hot designers that Vogue loved. And once he got us in, he was like, carry on. Like, goodbye. And we just, we got in and got a seat and just sat down and scurried somewhere. And so later on when I would do other internships, I just remember seeing him all the time and just being so grateful for that moment because he didn't have to do that. Like, um, I never worked with Condé Nast. I always worked at Hearst. And so Harper's Bazaar Magazine, 17, O Magazine, those are Hearst magazines versus Condé Nast's Glamour, Vogue, um, and Teen Vogue. So I didn't really work under his umbrella, but always saw him, always gracious. He did a huge thing for the St. Louis Fashion Fund one year where he came and spoke and it was amazing. Um, he just was a really good person. But as far as like the legacy and the financial part, I mean, they party back in the day and money was fluid. Um, he, he may not have had fiscal money, but he had money. He had yeah, money with Birkins. He had um, you know, one of a kind art, his that house, um, regardless of what the speculation was, he had purchased that home. He had made a deal with certain people for that home. And for some reason it was not honored correctly, but he had paid a lot of money for that home. He had furnished that home. Um, he was very careful about COVID. A lot of neighbors had said how when he would go get packages, he would make sure he was masked just to go to the door. So he was doing things, but he also, as a Kirby woman, um, he battled with weight. You know, he battled with obesity. He had went to Duke University for that weight loss. They had a huge weight loss thing. He had did that at one point, but Andre was amazing. You know, he was very slender and tall and everyone loved him. You know, the men loved him. The women loved him. Um, you know, just reading his memoir, if um, other people are really into fashion or let's say that young boy or those who identify as male, you know, want to get into fashion, read Andre Leon Talley's memoir and go on YouTube and see some of his speaking engagements. He really talks about his life and how he had grit, how he slept on the floor. He knew Halston. He knew all these people that were amazing and so when they finally did get to celebrate him in harlem you know naomi campbell everyone was able to fly in from all over the world but it just needed to be pieced together right so yeah he may not have had a lot of dollar amount in his bank account literally but he spent his money he traveled the world he had the most amazing luxurious fabrics and clothing and because he was a big and tall man i mean it's expensive and i think he was like a size 15 shoe or something and, you know, he wasn't wearing no cheap shoes. He wasn't wearing, you know, no shade, the hush puppy. But he wasn't wearing no hush puppies. Like, he was wearing custom stuff. And he had just gotten a huge contract with Ugg. So, you know, he was very much so valued. So I hate when people kind of say things that, you know, the fashion industry doesn't always pay you well. But Andre got paid really well. And, now, you know, some things may have happened with um, him and, you know, Vogue magazine and stuff. But... He was always something that young black people aspired to. Like, if if you wanted to get in fashion, honey, at some point you wanted to try to get a sit down with Andre Leon Talley so you could kind of navigate where he was going. So I feel like 
those are his seeds, his legacy. A lot of young photographers, a lot of young designers, editors who were able to reap off his fruit and really have a harvest. So hopefully a lot of people are doing scholarship funds for him and, you know, raising monies as we navigate to really coming back outside um, to put their money where their mouth is. Cause a lot of people did reap financially off of his success. So, so, so uh, Bootsy, as you see, the level of the show just went to another level. This young Man. one right here, <laughs> Denise Caldwell is raising the level of this show. I can hear the Monty coming towards the show. I can hear the I can hear the money. I can hear the change in the background. Yeah, I can oh, hear the man. bag. The, the respect level. Because she, she graciously broke me down. Let me tell you what's going yes. on, Mark Clark. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> no let's, shade. Let's, let's let's make this clear. And I love it because you know, I threw a little shade out there. She was like, she put in a little patty, fried it, turned it over, and put it on a nice rye piece of bread and ate it. It was a White Castle burger, but from St. Louis, though. The good White Castle <laughs> right. burger. She ate it on King's Highway. King's Highway okay. Natural Bridge. What so, up? Right. So Bootsy, <laughs> final questioner. For Denise, because she's got things to do. She's got an early day tomorrow. Any questions? Oh, no. you wrap I just want to say, I just want to say, it was really impressive. J just how insightful you are, uh, and just reading your bio was really amazing. And you're everything that Mark and people told me that you would be. You are, oh, you are really you. amazing. You really are. Bootsy. God bless you. I'm gonna be following you. And yeah, look, and, and I have some journalism kids that need to hear from you. I would love to connect. I teach a broadcast journalism class. I've sent 34 kids to college as mass comm majors. This year, all seven of my seniors went to college for free, two of them to Ivy League schools. What? So I would love for you to have a conversation with them at some point. I mean, if it's, if it's okay, I would love to get your information. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because I don't want to have to slide in your DM. And my slide in the DM. You. Well, look, this is my this is my baby girl. So yes, sir, watch yourself. So Denise, how can people follow you? How can people reach you? You know, how can people get in touch with you? And and Bootsy, I send you her information. I give you permission because she is family. She's my little girl. You're family. So go ahead, Denise. How how can people get with you? Oh yeah. So I am on Instagram at Style Expert Denise. Um, I'm on Facebook Style Expert Denise Caldwell and uh, YouTube, you can just put in style expert Denise Caldwell. All my lovely makeovers and fashion segments will come up from different media channels. And there's this little thing called Google. If you put Denise Caldwell in, I'll pop right up. <laughs> Denise, you have been a joy. Um, yes, you have. So excited. Oh, I mean, again, me. you you really do have a gift, Denise. I mean, you 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 are an effortless communicator, and then your knowledge and you know the stories are beyond your years. So just you're you're a treasure. And I just, I look forward to not only our relationship growing, but I look forward to seeing where you end up. Who knows? Bootsy, we are attaching our train to uh, Denise and we're Man. going to the ride. We're Man. going to touch the hem of the garment. Amen. All right. So, all right, Denise, that's going to be it again. Everybody, thank you for watching. If you're watching this, make sure you subscribe to the channels and follow and all that kind of stuff. And make sure you tell your friends about us. Have a great one, Denise. I'll talk to you soon. Bootsy Vegas, take care, my friend. Yes, sir. Peace out. It's barely morning, and somehow Mark Clark has to wake up. Of course, Mark has a little help. I just want to fall.